hey there. How you doing? Dave Fenoy here. Wednesday, of course. And of course, that means another Ask Dave Fenoy Anything. And it is 6 p.m. Pacific here on Facebook Live. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Hope you're telling your friends about us. And if you're interested in watching other Ask Dave Fenoy's, uh, all the previous ones are uh, collected on my YouTube channel, Dave Fenoy Voice Over Training. And also, since it's ho, ho, ho time, uh, we're having a holiday sale on uh, coaching. So if you're interested in Dave Fenoy coaching, you can go to my website, DaveFenoy.com. It's right, no, nope, it's right there. Yeah, there it is. You always have to get the, uh, which side are you on? 20% uh, off all packages, 5, 10, or 20. All right. Well, let's get down to it uh, with my good friend and uh, voiceover actor and musician. But before, before I bring him on, uh, you may not have seen uh, the CBS morning show uh, when they started talking about one of the growing areas in voiceover, dubbing. Well, uh, my guest Greg Chun uh, was the subject along with dubbing on uh, the CBS uh, Morning News. And uh, let's, let's just see what that was like. You've probably found a very innovative, often shocking program from South Korea. Squid Game has hit number one in 94 countries, including the US. It's part of an effort by Netflix to gather programming from all over the world and present it in local languages. Hey, did you hear that? Korean American Greg Chun is the English the voice of the main character, Song Gi Hoon. According to Netflix, casting actors of Asian descent for the dubbing was a deliberate choice. That's our job in there is to make every moment as believable as possible and try to convey as much of the original intent emotionally and dramatically that we can. But this is what might come to mind when you think of dubbed foreign movies. Well, I must find out the truth. Yes, of course. Kung Fu films from the 70s and their laughable lip syncs. Somehow we must get him. At any cost. Well, that means you were given the number one. Now Netflix is working to change that perception. A person died. That man there just died. Hello, cards. The original script is translated, Someone then the actor and director work together to ensure the dialogue fits the movement of the mouth on screen. In Korean, the way the language is structured, there are all these sort of pauses that wouldn't exist in English if we were expressing the same sentiment. Your mother and I were talking the other day. She told me you were out of the country on a business trip. Eventually, like getting to the point where, you know, you're two episodes in and you're not even paying attention to the fact that they're speaking English and they were originally speaking Korean. You're in grave danger. Follow me quick. Since 2019, American viewership of Korean dramas, including The King's Affection, has increased more than 200%. You're early? I told you. I've changed. And the attention to detail during dubbing is turning other non-English Netflix shows into hits, like France's Lupin and Spain's Money Heist. The process is a little like karaoke. Chun reads the translation as it scrolls across the screen. Did you hear that? We've got our screen here. You got your Greg invited you me to, to like give it a shot. How hard could it be? Out, you know? The words are going to go by as it goes along. You want to kind of have, keep one eye on that, keep one eye on the picture and the mouth. If you're moving, if you're standing up, if you're turning this way, it affects the way your speech comes out. It's subtle, but it's if it's not done, it's noticeable. I would imagine that facial expressions, they impact the way that your voice sounds. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Hey, did you hear that? A person died. That man in there just died. You're pitching up a little bit because you're trying to sound like him. His voice is you. Got He's it. He's you. Big, big, my man. Big, bigger, yell, bigger, yell, bigger, yes. Bigger. Wow, that is out of my comfort zone because that felt very big for me. Could someone do something? I won't be getting a call back. This is a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> oh, Dubbing wow. has evolved into a form of art. You have to respect the writing as well as the on-camera actor's performance. It's a big balancing act. Follow me quick. Greg Chun has brought more than 200 characters to life from Barbie's dad. Remember I made that ancient artifacts documentary a while back? <laughs> dad, you're being weird. To the scientist who resurrects dinosaurs. That ankylosaurus has only been incubating for 10 weeks. But he daydreams about meeting the real star of Squid Game. I would love to meet him. I would freak out if I met J.J. Lee, man. I mean, to say it's an honor to be his voice for this show is an understatement. Someday, maybe. Green light. And with promises of a season two on the horizon, that day may come. For CBS Mornings, I'm Carter Evans in Hollywood.
And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Mr. Greg Chung. Yay! Hello, hello. Oh, wow. Listen to all that raucous applause of those live people. Yeah, well, I, I got them uh, all locked up in a little room in the back. They, they do whatever I tell them. How are you? Yeah. They still sound happy. I'm good. I'm good. How are you, my man? Thank uh, you for I, having me. I am. Uh, I'm wonderful. And, you know, when uh, Squid Game came out, I, I, I watched it. And, uh, you know, I wanted to not like it because there's so much violence. It's, the concept is so weird, but it sucked me in psychologically. And I didn't realize uh, that you were the voice of the lead character until after I'd already been watched it. And it was like, whoa, Greg, amazing. Uh, Greg, I mean, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, and I knew you from video game work, of course. Uh, but, man dubbing and this show went number one on netflix and yeah. they're talking about a yeah. second season so uh fingers crossed they said that my character's coming back hopefully he'll have some cool stuff to do you know well, um he's a he's a fun character he's uh he's he's a flawed just trying to do the best he damn can kind of character and that's oh, yeah. uh, that's always fun to play. okay yeah. so well let's let's talk about uh your career we're going to get to uh dubbing uh, especially because that's what everybody wants to hear about now but uh how'd you get started in voiceover so i got started uh you know i was a composer for years writing music for tv commercials and, and tv shows and that kind of stuff and i think you know after a while um well, let me back up a little bit. In 2004, I was music directing uh, this musical at the Kodak Theater, now the Dolby Theater, called The Ten Commandments. And one of the leads of the show, we had Val Kilmer playing Moses, and then the love interest was a woman by the name of Nita Whitaker. You may know Nita. I know she was Nita. Back in the she day, was married to uh, Don LaFontaine before. To Don LaFontaine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so back in the day when, uh, you know, she was in, she was a Star Search $100,000 vocalist winner. Remember Ed McMahon and Star oh, yeah. Search? It's Star And so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah, laughing>, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I, uh, Nita and I met and I met Don through her. And so, you know, I, Don and I hit it off and became friends and we, you know, I, I, he brought me into his poker game and I met his other voiceover buddies and actor friends and stuff. And, you know, at the same time I was working, writing music and stuff for commercials and, you know, you hear the voiceover on that. I've always been a gamer. I, you know, you hear the voiceover on that. And I think just with meeting Don and really being pulled into the voiceover world and really starting to figure out that this was a career, I kind of eventually said, okay, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try and go for this. So 2009, I started coaching with Carol Kimball, who I met oh at That's VoiceOver. Oh, you know mm -hmm. all my old friends. Yeah. And Carol coached me for about eight months, private lessons once a week. And I was not good when I started. <laughs> I listened to those initial coaching sessions and man, I'm stuck in all the rookie habits and, and doing all the things that you got to you just got to live through and get through to be able to shake up, you know? Um, and then she uh, was in the same, at the time, Dave, you may remember, she was in the same building as TGMD. Oh, yeah. And yeah. she, yeah, at, at she that time, down. Tisherman was my agent then. That's right. That's right. I forgot about that. Um, and we, uh, you know, one day she said, I think they want to meet you. So let's go down the hall and let's, let's go meet them. And so I did. And I read for Ilko on a Blizzard project. And ended up booking it lo and behold um and then i told I, I tell this story a lot i was like this is easy and tgmd is like yeah sure come on in we'll take you i'm like oh man i'm on easy street now and i did not book another union gig for a year and a half that. <laughs> oh that easy for that, success beginner's luck <laughs> so hum so very very humbling and so um and that's but that's pretty much how it how it got started and and strangely ended up at don's agency and and your former agency and that's i mean it's that was that was it you know it it doesn't get much better uh than having the number one voiceover person ever take you <laughs> under his wing i i am so happy and proud to say that he and i were friends i was somebody else that he took under his wing um but to have and he was such a generous person 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. He felt no pressure of, oh, somebody's going to knock me off my throne. None of that, none of that at all. Because um, he knew it wasn't going to happen. Well, well, let me ask you this. <laughs> you mentioned I was making all the, the rookie mistakes. What, what were some of your rookie mistakes? So the biggest rookie mistake is, A, I produced my own demo. Now, oh. granted, since I had I had some competence with music and sound effects because of my other career, like it wasn't as horrible from a production standpoint. But as far as my whole concept of what makes a good voiceover demo, it was let me do all my wacky voices. And so I was in the wacky voice camp to start with. And the acting wasn't there, you know? I was sort of going, oh, I do this character and that character. And yet, if you listen to it, it's like, you know, it's like, yes, you're doing voices, but I don't believe any of them, you know? And, so and there you was... don't get a, a, a sense of who you are. Exactly. No, because they're all over the place. The voices were all over the place. So you just don't know what to do with it after you listen to me. So the demo was the big, big, big rookie mistake. The, uh, the other things were just sort of during coaching, kind of. I think trying too much to imitate folks like uh, like Don and like you. And obviously, I don't have the cavernous voices that you do. But as far as your delivery and that kind of stuff, I'm like, well, this is how Dave would say it. This is how Don would say it. And it's just it's inauthentic because it's coming from a place of imitation rather than it coming from me. So in a sense, I feel like every voice actor maybe needs to start off in the imitation phase and live through it. It's kind of like dating a few people before you get married. You know, you just kind of, <laughs> kind of get it out of your system, right? And uh, and it is educational to mimic and that kind of stuff. But eventually, you got to settle in on who you really are. And well, when well, I finally know, I, did that... Hmm. Hmm. No, I was just going to uh, say... I, 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 I actually think started that, working. Yeah. yeah. I, I was going to say, I think there's, there's something to be learned by... Uh, listening to and learning some things from people who are working. Uh, it's like being a musician. Uh, you want to learn to play the saxophone? Well, you better listen and imitate the, the best saxophone players. But sooner or later, you've got to come with your own thing. You've got to Absolutely. come with something that's that's genuine. Exactly, because, you know, they're – <laughs> they're going to say, okay, well, this guy's trying to sound like Dave Fenoy. We've got Dave Fenoy on speed dial. Why do we need to hire this guy, right? But once you once you learn and you absorb and you, you take what's good for you, what works for you, and discard what's not you, then it's like, hey, this person's doing something that I, I haven't heard before, and that's when you're doing yourself, you know? Okay, so. now correct me if I'm wrong, and yeah, we're going to get to the dubbing, but we, we got some other things to go through. Correct me if I'm <laughs> wrong, but... Uh, are video games where you're doing most of your work? Yeah, I would say so. That's still kind of like my bread and butter. Although dubbing is creeping up now. And I love dubbing work. I absolutely adore uh, live action dubbing because it's a very challenging medium. And uh, and 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 the, the fact is there's just great, great stories being told out there. And it's exciting to be a part of it, you know. Well, you know, it's it's where the world has gone. Um, I know looking at the last year and a half, uh, with the well, it's actually more than a year and a half now with the pandemic, um, yeah. it's changed a lot of things, and I don't know if it was going to happen before or not. Uh, but we're in a world now where we are looking at entertainment from around the world that's being dubbed from whatever language it was in into numerous other languages, uh, and whereas uh, you know a couple of years ago we probably wouldn't have thought these shows could be hits now yeah. they're yeah they're it's hits. definitely changed the way people are consuming you know because i mean i think people were starved for entertainment at being stuck at home for one and you know maybe it's just a matter of time you know for for kind of storytellers from other cultures and stuff to really get a voice on a global uh, you know on a global platform like netflix and uh, man once people start talking about something it just catches fire like we had no idea squid game was going to blow up like that like we loved the show working on it yeah but i, I mean now, <laughs> it now, was just, it uh, when, just when did happen, you, you know? when did you start working on it and how long did you work on it i recorded in the studio about i think between 40 and 50 hours um, was the time that I needed to record Kyun. And it was probably a good, I, I would say, three or four months before the show debuted that we were recording it. Uh, okay. um, and and so it, uh, yeah, there was, there was quite a bit of lag lead time on it. And then one day I was on Netflix, and my wife and I watch a lot of Korean dramas. So we get all the marketing for the new Korean shows coming out as sort of like our 
the first thing that they feed us when we sign on. So I, I signed on and I didn't even know the show was called Squid Game. It had a different code name, right? So all of a sudden I see this show and it's like Squid Game. And it shows the people walking on all the stairs, like, you know what I mean? They have that promo shot. I'm like, that's the show I worked on. It's called Squid Game? Like, what a bizarre name for a show. Well, let, let me ask you, but did was, you did you and your wife like the show before you got the show? Oh, oh my wife can't can't watch the show. It's way too violent <laughs> for her. <laughs> Neither can mine. <laughs> it was almost too violent for you. And oh. um you know, I, I showed her like uh, a bit of the first episode and maybe part of another episode. And she was like, good job, honey. That's good. <laughs> I love you, honey. Good job. But I ain't watching it. <laughs> I know. It's not going <laughs> Oh, listen, before we, we move further, uh, those of you out there in uh, Facebook Live land, if you have a question, a comment uh, that you'd like to share with us, with Greg Chun, uh, please go ahead and type it in. I want to get to as many of those as we can as we have our discussion. And oh my, here's one already. Um, <laughs> Jay Horace Black, who's with us all the time. Greg, congrats on your success. Question, do you, uh, do you do any dubbing from home or is it all in studio? Second, if you do it from home, what is your setup? Is it uh, via Source Connect, Clean Feed, or other? What is your mic chain? What kinds of things do you do? Uh, to master timing of dubbing, what's your pre-routine for dubbing sessions? Wow. Oh, that wasn't all just one question. Jay. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. I can go through these. I can. Jay, lovely to meet you. Thank you for the questions and thank you for the kudos. Um, dubbing has all been from home during the uh, pandemic. And, uh, but I will tell you, like it, technically it can be done, but it is easier if you go in studio because the internet causes a lot of, kind of little gremlins and glitches when it comes to timing to pictures. So I prefer doing dubbing in the studios, but I'm also paranoid of COVID, so I'm not quite there yet. Hopefully next year I'll be back in the studios. Um, so everything's been done at home. Um, what is my setup? So I use a Scarlett 2i2. I've got a 416 and a U87 sort of at the ready, depending on which studio, because they have different preferences. Um, and just going into an iMac. Uh, Source Connect, yes. And, uh, but a lot of times we don't use Source Connect. We use like IPDTL or we'll, they're all the, some of the studios have their own proprietary dubbing system that we use that are just browser based. So we do that. Um, what is what it? Is Connection Link Pro or? Um... Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Connection, Connect Link Pro, Connection Link Pro, something like that, Dave. Yeah, yeah I, I don't remember exactly. Um, and then uh, the mic chain is just the mic into the Scarlet, nothing else on it. They don't want anything on it. All the all the remote recordings you from home. It's so funny. I spent I don't even know how much money I spent on on this Shadow Hills compressor and this <laughs> uh, you know this freaking API five hundred EQ and this and that. Nobody wants any of that stuff. Nobody wants. I just it's just sitting here. I'm just gonna sell it on freaking uh, uh, Sweetwater Marketplace. So you don't need anything. Whoa, 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 you need your wait. mic. You, you have the interface. physical. You didn't buy uh, yeah. uh, plugins. You you've got the physical equipment. hardware. Oh yeah, you did. Yeah. Spend a ton. No, it was ridiculous. It was so dumb. And I don't know. I just got excited at one point. At one point, I, you know, whatever. Maybe I got a, a good paycheck in the mail. I'm like, I'm going to buy some real equipment, really put some candy on my voice. Nobody wants that. Absolutely nobody. So big waste of time. All you need is a decent mic, your uh, your your interface, and the recording space is the biggest and the most important thing. So it doesn't sound like you're in a, you know, in a toilet stall. Um, unless, unless you want to record from a toilet stall. But um, the... Uh, <laughs> The timing of dubbing, you know what? I attribute whatever competence I may have um, for timing and dubbing to being a musician. And Dave is also a musician. And so you know what I'm saying as far exactly as tempo. Saying. Yeah, you dub a line and it's just a little bit short. So you need to go a little bit slower. Like, what does that mean? There is an intuition, I think, as a musician that you have that you don't have to think about that too much. It just kind of happens. But um, I would say, you know, to develop that skill, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think playing music, if you have an inclination for music, does help. And um, and just practice, you know. I, uh, I and think, as far as I think, warm... I think the fact that you are a musician and we think in time and rhythm, uh, that mm -hmm. you you listen a little differently uh, than some other people might. So when you're listening, you're kind of listening for the rhythm of. Uh, but yeah. that brings me to a question that I have. Now I'm doing some dubbing. Uh, but I, I have to bow to you and and uh, the Squid Game uh, <laughs> uh, because uh, 
What do you think of dubbing in, in terms of artist technician? Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. So I still feel like artist needs to come first because from the technician standpoint, like, yeah, if you're not the greatest technician, it's going to take longer to get the line. But ultimately, you will get it within uh, some in some shape or form that the engineer can then tweak it and make it fit. So I feel like the acting is paramount. The people who are controlling the purse strings would say the technician part is paramount. Um, but that's my opinion. Is that, my opinion is that the art and the storytelling need to come first, and you know, the 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 rest of the team will make it work and fit. You know, um, I think your your ability as a technician more impacts how much maybe your marketability to the studios. If people know that, you know, it takes kind of a while for Greg to get his line right, well, I may not get as many calls as if they think, hey, you know what, timing with Greg is actually pretty easy and he he gets through the session and the lines that we need to get through on time. So yeah, we can consider him for this project, whatever. Yeah. yeah. We got a, uh, yeah. a hello here. G'day, Greg. Nice to meet you. Turning in from Australia. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, hey, Nick, Nick Miller. Uh, and, uh, I think you might know this guy, Joe Cipriano. Hey, what? Yeah. The master. Oh, man. And I gotta say, okay. Now that both you and Joe are here, you, I, I gotta say, you all don't know how much I idolize you guys. You know what I mean? Like when I started off, um, you, you, you all, you're all the household names. You know what I mean? And like, it's, it's so funny because when I met y'all, you're so nice and such good people and i remember dave running into you in between sessions because you do a lot of video game work yeah. and um I, I i had met you once i think and i saw you again i'm like hey dave fenoy because it's car it's hard to miss dave fenoy you know what i mean <laughs> and uh and you did this <laughs> i don't even know how to describe it it was sort of a skip you skipped up with your hand like this and 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 sort of skipped up to me and put your hand out and said, "Hey, Greg, how you doing?" And I was like, "Holy shit! Like, this this man remembers me. We met at like one event or something like that, and he's so nice. And it's just like that 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 is all the voiceover people will tell you that in general, the community is what what makes a big part of why the job is so enjoyable. It's because just such great people, and you're such a shining example of that. You always made an impression on me on how just warm." and and loving a person you are and joe same thing for you joe when we had you know the we were working on the poker night and stuff when we were working on your book you're all just uh just the loveliest people and i couldn't be prouder to be, to be well part you, of you know business. that's that's yeah. one of my favorite things about the voiceover community and people like a joe cipriano and yourself um and and the late great don lafontaine who just mm -hmm. embraced me and everybody else i saw within his sphere uh, and uh, I, I, it, I, I'm hoping it's a tradition that we maintain. Uh, but let's let's get back to uh, uh, working on the Squid Game. So you did most of this from your from home, or you said all of it from home. But all you did it. the CBS yeah. studio thing that was in somebody else's studio. Correct. Uh, yeah. Uh, as I was looking at that, I was like, "Wow, man, I'm doing all my dubbing from home." Uh, <laughs> how, come, how come they're not inviting me into the studio? I want one of those things to lean on. What was what was that uh, little that, lean? Oh, on? that thing's the best, man. That uh, it, it's just for comfort. It honestly is just if you get tired of standing there, you have something to lean on. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and you said a couple of things uh, to the reporter that was interviewing you about mm. uh, motion. And and where you're looking based on the movement of your character. Talk about that a little bit. So I when I dub, I really I really feel like a lot of what is going to help you sell it is in the details of what the person is doing. You know, a very very obvious example is if let's say your line is happening and your character stands up from sitting down from in the middle of the line. Well, you need to hear that. You know what I mean? If you're, if, 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 especially depending on who your character is, maybe your character is, you know, on the heavier side, maybe your character is wearing a suit of armor, you never know. All that kind of effort, I think, needs to go into the line uh, in order for it to really land. And so I, I will generally kind of mimic the movements of my character within reason. You don't want to create noise on the mic, obviously. But um, if, if I'm turning some way, if I'm pointing, if I'm kind of like, 
scratching my head or whatever. I'll do these things just from a performance standpoint. And as you add that to your vocal performance, those tiny little things can help, uh, you know, sell a moment through as authentic. So you know, you know that's it's interesting. Uh, when I'm teaching, this is one of the things I tell uh, my students: your your body informs your voice. And whenever we see people in real life or on in plays, on television, in movies, um, we can read what they're thinking, what they're feeling by their action. They're like, oh, well, so I'm trying to remember something. Oh, I want to sound like I'm smiling, smiling. And if you bring that. To all your performances, and I don't care what the the, the, the voiceover genre is, uh, you will bring more authenticity uh, to your read. And I bet nobody had to tell you that when you went into dubbing because that's what you do on video games. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It is. And I think the challenge with dubbing, live action dubbing especially, is that it's just much more detailed than animation and video games as far as what the actor is doing. And so there needs to be a real subtlety and you have to try and refine what you're doing quickly uh, to really hone in on what's going to help sell that moment. You know, And a perfect example, and this is something that I, I, I wish I could gather all the dubbing actors in a room and talk about a few you know, a few key things that I think are important um, that not everybody is doing. And I would really, really, for those of you aspiring voice actors out there, I want to talk to you about especially Korean material, because like in the interview that I said, the way the language is structured, there are these pauses. So a lot of lines end up getting written to the effect of, I don't understand what's going on here, right? There's this pause. It's like, why would you ever have that pause there? You don't in English, right? And so a lot of times I'll hear dubbing actors just sort of say, I don't, and then stop, and then continue their line. If you are going to have an unnatural pause in the line, the way it's written, and there's no way around it, there's got to be a way to justify why it is you're pausing. Maybe the emotion's stopping you. Maybe something catches your eye and it stops you. But it doesn't come out as, I don't understand what's happening. It comes out as, I don't, like, it gets choked off. It's very subtle. But it, it either it, it you know it can't just be a very properly spoken word that just hangs there. It doesn't make any sense, right? So things like that, those little things, dubbing wise, I feel like hopefully with the spotlight more on dubbing, that there will be more education and more training for specifically for the live action dubbing medium, so that those moments can be as you know, so we can keep them as sellable as possible. You know, um, that is such an interesting point. Uh, I'm a great believer. One of the things I, I, I will talk about, look, I'm trying to teach you to free yourself from the tyranny of words and punctuation because in real life, <laughs> we pause in places that the writer would never think to put in a, a comma or suggest that we pause. And sometimes they do put in a, want us to pause in this place because that's how they hear it. But we really don't have to. Uh, and it's usually based on... Uh, allowing yourself to honor some kind of inner dialogue or, as you were talking about just now, uh, something that interrupts you, something that catches your attention. Um, but this is what we do all the time as human beings. Uh, but wow, what a great, 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 great point. Uh, let me get another question here. Theo Mezzacapo, question for Greg. How long does it take before you can really get a character down? When, uh, can, you, when can you truly inhabit them? Also, I love both judgment games. Uh, Yagami uh, is, to me, one of the great video game protagonists. You're awesome. Good, sir. Oh, Theo, thank you so much. And that means so much to me because Yagami is my... That's, that's the role of my life. You know what I mean? It's, it was my first real video game protagonist role, and it's one that I... I do feel like I emotionally I inhabit, I slide into it when, 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 when I record him. And um, it does take some time, you know, and thankfully, uh, you know, a lot of times when we record a video game and if you're playing a principal character and uh, a lot of times by the end, when you've really gotten into the character, a lot of times we'll revisit earlier cutscenes and we'll sometimes re-record stuff if it makes sense to, to really make sure the character remains cohesive across the game. So I would say it probably took me a good four or five recording sessions. 
I think, to really start feeling who Yagami was. And a lot of the stuff in, in, in video games can just be sort of like, you know, cuts or not cutscenes, but just sort of like in-game dialogue and efforts and this and that. It's not really a big deal there that you'd be 100% connected. But the stuff that was important, if there were cutscenes and story elements and stuff like that, that we needed to revisit to kind of with my new perspective, kind of inject what I had absorbed back into those scenes, we did that. Um, and I think it also uh, varies. It depends on the character. There are characters that you slide more easily into because they're sort of more like you are naturally than others. Um, Giyun is very, from Squid Game is very much like me. Like, I hope I'm not as much of a loser as he is, but <laughs> as far as like his goofiness and his approach to life where he kind of doesn't really like to think about the bad stuff and just wants to, you know... <laughs> be positive and be a dreamer who thinks he's going to make all this money gambling. I mean, you know, um, that's very me. And so that, I, I think Gion was one of those characters that I kind of got into uh, a little bit more quickly than others. Oh, spend a lot of time in Vegas, huh? <laughs> no, I used to. Oh my gosh. Oh, it was boy. a birthday tradition every year. Yeah, it was a birthday tradition, man. The craps table, best place ever. Oh, so uh, did you win more or lose more? I lost a lot. Oh, yeah. They they don't keep building those uh, <laughs> bi those 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 palaces to gamble because they're giving away money. <laughs> Troy That's Allen right. has a question or a comment. Let's see. I think it's both. Hey Greg, uh, has your favorite video game or anime roles been the ones you personally connected uh, the most with emotionally, the one you feel you perform best as, or the one you're most or the one you're most famous for? I'm in I'm in an abridged series of demon why can't I read the words an abridged series <laughs> of demon slayer where I am Muzan and absolutely love your performance. Well that's amazing Troy I am honored to share the role with you that is super cool you should post that I would kind of love to see it. Um you know to answer your question my favorite role I mean <clears throat> I think it does have to do with all of those things connected to being connected emotionally, um, having enjoyed my actual performance the most. Um, I don't know if, you know, Yagami is probably not as widely known as, say, you know, maybe Naga from Call of Duty, just because Call of Duty is Call of Duty, you know. Um, and, um, and there are other roles out there that I think, you know, like Ike from Super Smash Brothers would probably jump to mind for people more than Yagami from Judgment. But, um, I think the reason, all of those reasons can contribute to my affection for a character, but I think in the case of Yagami, it was everything around it. Um, the fact that it was my first lead role, I mean, that was, that makes an impact when you walk into the studio and you realize this is your game. That's a whole lot of It's all dopamine. on your shoulders. <laughs> yeah, and a pressure. <laughs> but just the, the serotonin rush and just the, uh, the, the promotion that we did for Yagami and, and, and getting to go to E3 and this and that. I mean, it's it's a very special thing. So a lot of things contribute to what, what makes a character special to me, but those things that you mentioned certainly are important factors. Uh, I'm going to pop another question up here. Well, so actually, it's not a question. It's a comment on what we were talking about. Heather Lynn Watt, agreed everyone I have had the privilege to meet or learn from have been the nicest human beings ever. Uh, you know, yay voiceover community. Uh, <laughs> yes. Let's see. Sunhal Al Rals, uh, what do you have to keep? What do you have to keep your voice smooth or to rejuvenate it after a rough session? I'll ask the both of you on this since Greg already knows me from his streamings of playing games badly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm the hashtag dad gamer that played video games like a dad. But uh, Sue Hale. Uh, as far as I, uh, David, I may have similar answers, but there is the magic Chinese syrup, the Peipakoa, Nam Jim Peipakoa, that we all use. Um, and just stop talking, drink tea, hydrate, and sleep. That's pretty much uh, it. You know, well, I'm I'm going to uh, concur. Uh, I like the low quat and honey. <laughs> uh, and it, it kind of soothes. Now, what's interesting, uh, a few weeks ago, I went to see a voice doctor who was having some uh, issues with some raggediness and, 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 and a little lack of power in my throat. And I know it was from overuse. Um, and she looked at my 
pipes, and she said, oh, well, everything's normal. And she said, what do you do? And I mentioned that and hot tea and, and honey and lemon. And she says, well, you know, none of those things actually really does work. Uh, and I'm like, well, what kind of doctor are you? I, they definitely work for me <laughs> all the time. Uh, but one of the best things, and uh, on this, uh, she and I did agree, rest and hydration. Um, sometimes the best thing you can do is just shut the F up. <laughs> <laughs> just keep it quiet for a while. Oh, boy. Yeah. Let's see. Got another one. Dustin Frank. Is dubbing faster pace? Uh, what is dubbing faster pace? What's your average session time uh, to completed work time? You know, we have punctuation for a reason. <laughs> um, this is the way the young kids communicate nowadays, Dave. We yeah, got to get this. Yeah. And and you know, there are, there are uh, acting teachers that will pull all the punctuation out of scripts. Uh, yeah, which I I think is nuts. I like to leave it in there, but then ignore it. Uh, but as uh, as you were saying, is dubbing faster um, pace? And what's your average session time uh, to completed work time? You know, I wouldn't say dubbing is necessarily faster paced. It's a different medium. I don't think you can really compare dubbing and, say, video game work um, when it comes to sort of lines per hour or whatever. Um, I don't put a whole lot of thought into that. I feel like the time you take is the time you take. And you know, you got to get the lines right. You know what I mean? Um, they, there is an expectation, I think, that you will record a certain number of lines per hour, but that's not really your concern as an actor. You've got to just do the best you can. If you don't happen to hit the numbers, well, you certainly wouldn't want to hit the numbers at the expense of your performance, right? So for me, if I have to rush through to make some kind of quota and I don't have a good performance on tape, I'd rather not be in that role, you know? Um, so I think as an actor, it's best not to worry about that and let the director in the studio handle, like, are we moving fast enough? And you just do your damn best because that's, that's what's going to get the best product for you and that's what's going to get the best throughput for the studio as well. You know, um, I agree and I disagree. I, I think... Uh just doing video games, you're going to go through a lot more lines faster than dubbing. Uh, because with dub, with if you're doing a video game, uh, you're recording, if you're in character, uh, you get the line right, uh, you've done A, A, B, C, they pick which one, on to the next line. With dubbing, uh, one, it's, uh, I know when you, you showed uh, the technique of it, you're looking at a screen with actors on it, and the dialogue those actors are saying is rolling by underneath. Mm -hmm. And you have to not only get the dialogue right, uh, but it has to match the lip flap. Uh, and I have found, and maybe I just work slower with that area, but uh, it, <laughs> take, it takes longer per line, I think, uh, to do dubbing. Oh, than, yeah. No. I, agree, I, I think Dave. that's I kind agree. of his no, question. Yeah. Oh, okay. If that was the question, I may have misunderstood it. Then, yes, it definitely does take longer to get dubbing lines because, you know, with, with video games, if you are using Japanese or whatever uh, previous, you know, source language as your reference, they just play the line and you just go. For dubbing, you got to preview it with the picture, and then the engineer needs to reset, and then there's you got to lead up to it because you got to get timing right. There's, it's just a slower process, you know. Um, plus, a lot of video game work is going to be, you know, one word efforts and shouting out these short in game <clears throat> things. Yeah, exactly. Um, whereas in dubbing, it's all story based and dialogue based. So, yeah. Sorry if I misunderstood the question. No, but, it's, yeah, Dave, it's, it's okay. Dave, Dave. But even then, uh, you know, you, you're going to have some breaths and some. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Uh, William Escobar, besides reaching out to your community, does having outlets like Twitch help with some of the competitive nature of voice acting and getting yourself out there? Um, I don't find that Twitch for me anyway, has anything really to do with my voice acting career as far as it's somehow increasing my visibility and making me more marketable or making me eligible for jobs that I wouldn't otherwise. Everything pretty much comes through my agent. 
Um, and so as far as somebody who's, uh, at, at least in my stage, where, where my careers are right now, if you were starting off, um, I mean, it all depends on who's watching your stream. If the casting director for Disney is watching your stream and they love you, sure, that's going to work out pretty well. <laughs> but um, I don't know if Twitch streaming is necessarily the most direct route to voiceover work. I think there there isn't, sadly, I don't think there's a ton of uh, shortcuts unless you are a full-blown celebrity, right? Yeah. Um, if you are a full-blown celebrity, a YouTuber or whatever, or if you become huge on Twitch, sure, yeah. But uh, I think becoming huge on Twitch, the numbers are just as unlikely as becoming, you know, huge in voiceover animation. I mean, it's, everything is is tough and it's a grind. So it's just a matter of which grind you wanna you wanna put yourself through. You know, I I, I so agree with you, and I think sometimes it's because uh, when you're looking at Twitch. Uh, Twitter, to a certain extent, you're looking at fans uh, of a game, uh, but who we want to market ourselves to, who we want to know about us, are the people who produce and cast the games. Uh, and there you probably uh, need to be more on a, a LinkedIn uh and and doing the work and, and having contacts with those people. Oh, boy. Uh, speaking of those people, uh, actor and director Lonnie Manella uh, has a hey, question. Lonnie. And, and let she's written a book here. Uh, <laughs> let's see. To, I'm sorry, it's all over your face. Let me put it over here. And uh, <sighs> having recently directed and cast a Korean game, I never could get anyone emailing me to speak to me or explain the game at all. Their English and emails was perfect, but I had to rewrite many lines to make them flow. But I wonder why they refused to talk over Skype or anything, even uh, when I'd be up in the wee hours to account for the time diff. Could it be that they don't feel their English is not good enough? Would it be so much nice? It would be so much nicer uh, to at least have the slightest info about characters or plot. I had to come up with multiple choice pronunciation guides so they could choose the right guess. I wonder if there's a trick to encourage communication with companies like the Korean one I'm talking about. Hmm. Oh gosh, Lonnie, I, I have no idea. I'm so sorry. Um, you know, I don't really operate on that level. Um, you know, as far as interfacing with the actual clients. Um, and, and, you know, can me, I, can I say, I, I didn't pre-read that before, but can I say, um, I don't think we should judge, uh, a whole country's industry in, uh, in in video games or or uh, anime based on one experience with one company. Uh, this may be a company that, for whatever reason, uh, the communication wasn't good. But um, I know there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of business uh, coming out of uh, Korea. And I can't imagine that the majority of these companies are communicating badly. Just yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I know I agree with you, Dave. And I think that uh, yeah, I'm sorry you had that experience, Lonnie, but I don't know. I don't imagine there's sort of like a uh, sort of like a the the Korean secret or whatever it is that you might be referring to. I think it's uh, you know the particular team that you're working with. There may be some idiosyncrasies there that uh, that like Dave said, there needs to be kind of a, a an improvement in how the communication is done, but um, I hope things are better on your next project with them. Well, absolutely, and and this is such an international uh, market. Uh, I was with a student today who has been uh, uh, promoting herself to uh, independent developers, and uh, she's picking up work all over the world. Um, so they're out there; they're looking for you. Uh, they are available, and uh, she said she's having a wonderful time um, and in great communication with a lot of different devs from around the world. So I, I, I think that was just an unfortunate experience that you were having, Lenny. Um, Greg, so you've got your career going, and I know uh, Squid Game in so many ways is just going to boost you to whatever that next level for you is. Uh, 
Somebody knocking on the door now, what are some of the things you think they might do uh, getting started to uh, have a career like yours? You know, for me, the way that I got people to know who I was, was just taking every workshop in town and meeting every casting director I could who's out there willing to meet people. Um, you know, your agent will do some of the work, but you do much better if you are your own best advocate, if you're hustling on your own behalf out there. So um, I feel like, you know, there's, there's, I don't know if Mary Lynn is still, because obviously I've been out of the workshop circuit for a while, but when I was coming up, there was Mary Lynn Wisner, there was Voice Actors Network, there were these places that were sort of one-stop shops for here's who's meeting actors this month. You can read for them, right? Um, Get your, you know, once you've taken the classes and you've had several people who have no interest in blowing smoke up your ass tell you you're ready, you're a great, you're a great actor, you know what I mean? Um, start meeting people in town. And then as far as, uh, you know, dubbing work goes, which I think is going to really boom. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it, we're, yeah, we're it's, in its, it's infancy. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, it again is about meeting folks at the studios. I know that uh, a lot of the studios offer some class, and that's a good way to get on people's radar. And just networking with other, you know, you know, I think it's becoming more and more common. Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but you'll some of the casting directors we know will reach out and be like, "Hey, look, we need more, you know, Korean talent for this project. We need more of this talent that we need authentic Spanish speaking talent for this project." Yeah. Yeah. And so the more people that you know. The more you're out there and, and meeting with folks and having people understand that you're able to do the job, that's going to help you as well as far as word of mouth referrals and stuff like that goes. I, I think you're making a super good point there. Community. Um, people are always your best resource. So uh, I believe, and especially in the times we're in now, we're finally, uh, we're not looking for John Wayne to play Genghis Khan. Um, <laughs> where we, we want to, if, if this is a Latin character, let's get a Latin person. If it's a black character, let's get a black person. If it's an Asian character, let's get an Asian person and so forth. Um, this is a good thing. Uh, and you know, it doesn't mean that, oh, Greg is only going to be, uh, letting people know about, uh, Asian uh, actors that he knows, uh, cause he's, he knows some of everybody, uh, <laughs> the same with me and, and that does happen. Uh, I do get uh, uh, questions uh, from casting people from time to time about who do I know that fits this category. Um, so, and and I've I've noticed over the years, uh, voiceover people often going, well, you know, I'm not right for this, but you should call someone. Absolutely. So absolutely, uh, and it and and I don't. It's not even. Uh, and now. Um, Things are changing, obviously, and the way that people kind of get discovered, whatever that means, is different. But I feel like the same old grind is still there and still valid, which is, you know, hone your craft, get to the point that you're ready, and then meet the agents, meet the casting directors. Be And beyond that, be professional. Establish yourself as a brand of somebody who is fun to be around, who create solutions and not problems who isn't doesn't create drama doesn't you know what i mean all of that stuff i've said this a billion times people will much rather work with the less talented person who's a delight to be with than somebody who's a genius and a total pain in the ass so that whole kind of how you carry yourself all that stuff that needs to be done and it just takes time it just takes time for you and your name and your talent and your work to get out into the community so that people are aware that you're there and you're available. I always tell everyone, I started pursuing voiceover. I started coaching with Carol in 2009. I wasn't working regularly until 2016. It took me seven years to actually have it be something of a career where I could start letting and, go of some And in so many problem. ways, it's like going to college and graduate school. Time mm -hmm. Absolutely. And... And money spent, just, although it, it costs a lot of money to take classes and so forth, you spend a lot less than college costs now. <laughs> that's true. College is nuts. Oh, boy. But that's the thing. One of the things for aspiring for kids. Actors, I, <laughs> yeah. My kids are done with college. They're grown now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't rub it in. Um, 
But I feel like that's something that is a very, very important reality for aspiring voice actors to understand is that it takes time. Even Joe, Joe has the greatest thing where he talks about um, when you're working on your craft, when you're doing, you know, putting together a digital postcard that your agent can send out when you're revamping your demo, all this work that you're doing, when you do that, there's a little red light that goes on on your head, the top of your head. And the whole, the gods, the universe, whatever, they see that. Okay. And that's what gets their attention and gets things going in your favor. And it takes time that you consistently do that for them to go, Hey, you know what? That light goes on a lot. Let's pay attention to that person. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's a time and a commitment that I think people need to be prepared for if they really want to do this work. Yeah. Hey gang, we're getting down to the last 10 minutes. I'm going to bust through a bunch of questions here. Uh, and see what some people have to say. And let's start with Francisco Gonzalez. Hi there. A few questions for both of you. Video game roles. Do you have a favorite genre of game to work in? Any preference between working on AAA or smaller projects? Also, what do you think of the recent SAG low budget game agreement? Um, so I'll jump in. Um, a favorite genre of game to work in? Um, Anything story-based, anything that has a lot of dialogue for me. Um, any preference between working on AAA or smaller projects? AAA projects are obviously exciting because of their scale. Smaller projects can be incredibly charming because they don't, uh, because they can be so off the wall and different, and there can be amazing material in there. So they're both very, very rewarding in different ways. What do I think of the low-budget game agreement? I haven't worked under it yet. I'm going to for my first time. I know what the rate is, and I'm, I'm, I love that it's there, because it's much, much better, I think, for games that just simply don't have the luxury of a gigantic budget. To have the option to go union and at least have us work union and have us contribute to pension and health and all that kind of stuff, than to just go, okay, well, I've got to go non-union and that's the only way I'm going to get this done. I really feel like there are incredibly talented game designers and writers and producers out there that have amazing stories to tell and the world should hear them. And to be able to bring us in because ultimately it's up to us to say, well, that's not enough. I'm not going to do that game. I will never turn down a union gig. I don't care what the rate is. Um, because somebody who is thinking along those lines clearly cares about actors and performance. And it's that type of energy that I want to be a part of. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I'm glad, too. And basically, uh, all your answers were all my answers. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just move on to the next question. Uh, Thanks, Dunstan Francisco. Frank, I'm not sure if it was covered, but when did you become aware of the voice acting business and who is it uh, that that one voice actor that inspired you? Uh, and I think you did, uh, if I recall, Don LaFontaine. Uh, mm -hmm. In the music business, you met Don and got inspired and, and the rest is history. Uh, yeah, and that was around 2005, yeah, 2005 yeah. or so. Jeremy Napish. Networking is good for connecting with other people in the industry. So true, so true. And, uh, and essential. Yeah. And Jeff Burns. Hey, Dave. Hey, Greg. Hey, Jeff. Hey, what's up? <laughs> good to see Chris you, bro. Christina Tattersall. Thank you, Greg, for showing that it took you seven years to get traction. That helps put all the work I'm putting in uh, into perspective. Um, You're very welcome, uh, yes. Oh, I had a student today, and we've been working uh, for some time, and uh, this was the last in a series uh, that she had. She said, well, you know, when I started working with you, I, I know I was going to have this X number of, of sessions, and then we're going to jump on my, my, my demo, and, and uh, I was just going to – well, she's not ready to jump on her demo yet. She's gotten much better, but she's not ready to jump on her demo yet. And one of the most important things to me with her is that she knew – I've made progress, but I'm not ready yet. And so many people that I run into uh, are so eager to get to the finish line. Uh, they don't want to take the steps. Uh, you, you, you can't rush through anything. You can't bypass anything. You've got to get your uh, – you, you may have talent, but you also need skill. Uh, you need confidence in yourself. It's like when you're doing a play and you haven't rehearsed, you don't remember your lines well, uh, your performance is going to be bad because you didn't take care of that one little thing you really needed to take care of. So make sure you're ready before your demo. Uh, make sure you're doing uh, your, your homework 
of uh, marketing yourself uh, to agents, to mm-hmm. companies. Uh, and let's get another question. Oh, it's Dunstan again. Uh, triath- triathlon training is the first leg, getting your demo and marketing yourself. Second leg. Third leg, you're always learning, always training. So true, so true, so yeah. true, mm-hmm. so true. Uh, and I skipped a couple of things back here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, what was this? Troy. Uh, oh, uh, Annie. Uh, that's going to be for somebody other than us. <laughs> he's, he's advertising on the show. Yeah, uh, Troy. I don't know, Troy. I don't know if you have access to Discord, but post that in my Discord. We'll love to watch it. Okay. And well, if you go to Facebook after the fact, it'll be there. It'll be there in the comments. Uh, well, I I think that probably uh, covers all of that. And, you know, we've got a, a few minutes left. So what's next on your plate? What are you doing right now? It's coming to the end of the year. What are you doing right now to prepare for 2022? Well, I'm trying to make a couple other uh, modifications to my stream. I'm always adding stuff to my Twitch stream because I love my community and we have a really good time together. Um, I'm prepping for a couple big video game jobs that are coming up uh, that should keep me busy kind of next year uh, and um, and putting out a piano album. So I'm putting out a piano album of video game music, and that's uh, that's going to be dropping early next year. Um so yeah, there's a couple on my Twitter. There's a couple of preview tracks. I have the uh, the Fallout Four main theme. And Dave, you and I, oh, Dave and I were in Fallout Four together, and we were in part of the story where we each put a hit out on each other, and the player has to decide which one they're gonna whack. You know, that's one of the the crazy things about video game. Now you are a player. You are definitely a video game player. I'm not a, a video game player. I'm I'm just an actor who lucked up into doing a lot of video games, but. <laughs> All the time, I'm running into pals like you, you know, well, back when we actually were in studios a lot, but we'd run into each other and go, oh, yeah, you know, I'm on such and such a game. Or, you know, we're, oh, you're on this game too? Wow. Uh, You generally don't know until the game is uh, done and out. Oh, Mm -hmm. gosh. Oh, so-and-so's on. Uh, So uh, when you played (laughs) that game, did you uh, fall out? Did you you kill me? Uh, I... (laughs) I actually didn't play Fallout 4 yet. I'm going to play Fallout New Vegas on stream before I get to Fallout 4. Wait a minute. What? New Vegas came out when? Oh, you're in New Vegas. That's right. New New Vegas is an old game. Yeah. But I only started streaming just over a year ago. So I've been playing RGG stuff that I've been in, Judgment and Lost Judgment, and now I'm playing Yakuza Like a Dragon. Um, I have a list of games that I want to play. And uh, yeah, Fallout 4. Uh, Fall in New Vegas is, uh, is pretty close to the top of the list. Oh, so, boy. Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, I, uh, well, we're at the top of the hour here. Uh, I always like to keep this to an hour. Greg, uh, you have been an absolute pleasure. I am so, so, so happy for your success uh, with Thank Squid you, Game. Uh, it's the kind of thing that, I don't want to say it'll change your life, but it's the kind of thing that uh, makes you memorable. Uh, it's the kind of thing that that people are going to remember you for down the line, if and when we ever get to just go back to conventions. Uh, you're going to have long lines of people uh, waiting <laughs> for your autograph uh, for Squid Game, and uh, that that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Well, Thanks, Dave. I really appreciate you having me. And it's great to see you again, brother, man. It's, yeah, it's crazy, yeah. man. This world. And listen, my best to the family. Uh, you know, uh, you as what, well. What, your kids are how old? Oh, I've got the one kid. He's five. Oh, just the one. Five. Now. Oh, boy. Yeah. I yeah. remember when he was born. <laughs> I know. Oh, he's boy. Married. What's he what's want for Christmas? <laughs> he actually told us to tell Santa not to come this year. We're still unpacking where that's coming from. I have no idea what it's about. So. Oh, 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 boy. I don't know. I don't That's know. It's a strange boy. That's, <laughs> don't tell Santa not to come this year. Maybe somebody told him. <laughs> yeah. Santa. Maybe somebody told him Santa doesn't exist. But, you know, the idea <laughs> of some strange guy who lives at the North Pole sneaking yeah. into your house in the middle of the night is kind of scary. It could be alarming. It could be it alarming. Is. It is. Anyway. Eat your food and leaves. Anyway, have a great evening, uh, and uh, hopefully we can see each other soon. 
Um, I would love that. And thank you so much for spending some time and, and sharing some of your thoughts. My pleasure. My pleasure, my, pleasure, my friend. friend. All right. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Greg Chan, uh, one of the nicest guys in this business, also one of the most talented. Uh, so happy to have him on. Uh, just a reminder, um, this and all the other Ask Dave Fenoy's Anything live on my YouTube channel, Dave Fenoy VoiceOver Training. Uh, if you are interested in voiceover coaching with me, DaveFenoy.com, 20% off right now through the end of the holidays, uh, which would be uh, the 31st. So um, all the best. I'll see you next week. It'll probably just be me. We'll have a little chit-chat, just you and I, uh, next week. In the meantime, book something. See ya. <laughs>